Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to take a trip down the lane of where we've kind of come from in terms of merit. You know, what does what does merit have to do with our government, with our businesses, etc.? And Ron's done some research on it. And I think it's going to be an interesting topic. He's going to be talking about how merit has affected us in America and how it affects us in business. So with that, Ron, you know, uh, take it away, please. Sure. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I... Uh... I'm, I'm stealing some of this information from a book called The Aristocracy of, of Talent uh, by a gentleman by the name of Woldridge, who has been a, a very long time author. Uh, his background includes time on uh, many years, I should say, on The Economist magazine staff as a writer editor. And uh, so <clears throat> he has some pretty interesting things to say and comes with uh, a lot of authority. It's one of those books that you thumb you thumb through it, and um, this this much is his research. You know, so you got the book, and then you got you know I don't know twenty percent is research as to where these things came from, and so it's an extremely well researched book and has a lot of really wonderful points uh, to it. And so I thought. Uh, it's not really a, a book review, but I thought we'd just have a discussion about merit or the meritocracy. Uh, and, uh, and and so I'll go through just a couple of points here. I uh, I, I mentioned this to um, one of our one of our micro giants, and the question was, well, what is meritocracy? I'm not sure I really understand what that is. And um, of course, it has to do with you know being promoted. Uh, uh, based on merit, on coming up with, uh, you know, good ideas and better products and being rewarded for that so that, you know, people have an incentive to do to do good work or to think creatively, et cetera. So um, it's just that whole idea that if you do if you do something well, you get some benefit. It might be um, salesmen getting a, getting the commissions. It might be bonuses for the production people. There are a whole lot of ways. And and of course, uh, you know, Ray, you've you've advocated um, using meritocracy uh, as incentives in manufacturing forever, and paying people based on their productive value. Um, for, for, I don't know, as long as we've been around, you know, I mean, yes. you and I have known each other decades now. And, uh, and I know that, that Ed, you, you strongly believe in, you know, supporting people who, who do good work. Uh, so the three of us, the three of us as consultants, um, constantly talk to our clients about being sure to, uh, spread some of the wealth around and let people know that they're doing a good job, both both through um, good and consistent work reviews, and, uh, but also in term in terms of money. But we have so many things that will and we'll talk about. Them. We have so many things sort of in our way now. It kind of makes it hard to to be a believer in rewarding people for good work. So let me kind of run through a couple of basics here. One of the things that uh, Woldridge mentions is that um, countries that are merit-based, uh, meaning they're not familial, they're not letting, they're, it's this, they're, they're not giving jobs to their nephews, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are that are class-related. In other words, you don't hire one class of people over another that are inherited. Um, a lot of people don't realize it. he went through, I don't know, three chapter, chapters on history, but where we came from was a place in England. And of course, the reason we rebelled and left was partially this, and that is that if you were in a certain class, the upper class, the middle class, the lower class, you weren't allowed to, to, to move. And class mobility is something that we in, in the United States have been very, very proud of, I believe, throughout our history, to the point of doing our best to reduce and eliminate classes. In other words, you could come into this country poor, and some of our more celebrated people are the ones who, who you know, went out of this world rich. And there are so many of them um, that, that come in and make a lot of money 
uh, and then and then give in many cases give that money away uh, from you know Getty to Rockefeller etc. Um, they they had very little and they made a lot of that. Well, in England, it would have been inherited by the oldest son, and it would have been maintained within that simple that 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 sort of a. Uh, um, simple way of passing and making sure that the bulk of the assets stayed in place for generation after generation after generation. And so merit base is also, you know, personal contacts or bought. And again, um, I guess I didn't realize how many times in the, in the military you could buy a captainship. Uh, this is in England and Europe. You could buy a captainship, you could buy a generalship, you know, you just paid so much money to the king, uh, or and, and and you just bought your <laughs> bought your job, and so it didn't have anything to do with competency at all. It just had to do with who you were, and that's how jobs were given. And so, when he went through and did this, that they did a, a a major study on this. This was he's citing a major study. They discovered that the Northern European countries cluster at the top cluster at the top of performance while the Southern European countries are at the bottom. And uh, Greece still rewards political jobs to supporters. And Italy has a whole culture of what they call nepotismo, in other words, nepotism. Right. And, and both of them have very strong labor movements, which restrict people from dissenting, from getting paid more for good work, uh, certain kinds of work hours, in other words, the labor unions are so strong that they actually control the workers. The workers may get benefits from that, but they also lose the opportunity to rise above their fellow workers. In other words, it keeps everybody based on a certain category within the, the restrictions of the union. So in looking at that, it became kind of interesting that the countries that really value what we have, what we have called and uh, the, the work ethic in this country, um, those who get out and work and make it happen uh, and, and receive the rewards, that many of the countries, that most of the countries that perform poorly have a culture that is not merit-based. And so that kind of is the overriding thought. Well, how do you, how do you prove that? Or how do you, you know, proof it? And the proof comes from, 20% of the growth of GNP can tr be attributed to better allocation of talent. In capitalism, we talk about the advantages of the money going to where the, you've got a good company, you've got fast growth, you've invented a new product, you're creating a market. You know, the, there's free movement of capital. Well, I hadn't really thought very much about it, but when you have free movement of talent, it's the same kind of thing. So, you know, when people, when you've got good people and they can move from one company to another company because, frankly, they're worth more than the current company thinks they're worth, um, you get these people who are high performers, who are, are able to have mobility and move into to another, another place, another job, and therefore you have higher gross national product in each country or the world because the, the movement of talent is, is allowed and rewarded because they're meritocracy. And then here's another one um, among several facts, uh, but this has a lot to do with us and what we do because we work with so many family companies. And that is that public companies outperform family companies unless they take precautions of hiring, pro help, help, of hiring professional managers. That would include our discussions on, you know, board arrangements and having outside people look in and professional people, accountants, lawyers, et cetera, and consultants to, to come in and, and help them move forward. Why is that? Well, there's this sort of this unwritten thing, and that is that family members don't get fired. So um, when, when you, you don't have the carrot and the stick, you have low performance. And I think... Uh, I don't know. I think we probably agree on that because we've all worked with family companies, and I think we, we would agree that they need a lot of prodding in order to be able to get up to snuff compared to professionally run ones. No, I I, I would agree, and I think uh, Ed will have some comments on that. But you know, basically, the challenge of family-owned companies is that you know um, 
Johnny or Susie or whoever, you know, is automatically shifted up to the position of uh, CEO or whatever. And as you pointed out, there's there's no there's no relationship between their skill sets and their aptitude. Mm -hmm. it's simply a function of them. Um, well, it's nepotism. I mean, it's, well, it's nepotism. Yeah, yeah, that's right. that's exactly right. And so, and so, it just whenever you have that, um, you know, it really it it really takes an extraordinary effort to make sure that it is not nepotism, but that you're putting qualified people there, even though they may be part of the family, um, that can get that job done. That particular that particular based on particular skill levels and so it's really important that that um the uh say the <clears throat> the previous generation uh, make sure that they properly prepare those those the, the children uh or the nieces and the nephews etc so right. that they are in fact viable candidates for the jobs that they take over uh, there's a lot of resentment among employees in a company like that where um, they see that <clears throat> performance is lagging from from any given family member, uh, and that can really destroy morale. Would, would you agree, Ed? By the way, you you lost your light there. We can't see your face like we did see it before. Oh, I don't know what happened. There you, um, there you but go. Anyway, um, I totally agree with this, and I think it should be something we should every consultant should have at the top of their calling card, and that is this statement. This is. This is a pretty profound statement. Public companies outperform family companies um, by a lot. Yeah. And um, the only way uh, a family run company that can improve performance is to bring some people in from the outside that can help them make the company more profitable with less risk and preparing for the next generation transition. And um, so this this really is, and if there's evidence behind this statement, that even gives it more power. That that's a pretty impactful statement. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with you. And so the the uh, the downside of this is so there there's kind of the upside. It's like wow, this this stuff works. Uh, but we particularly in the United States today, we have all kinds of things that are in the way. So I just kind of briefly th threw out a few of these things. There'll be a lot more, but they're just things that have happened in our culture that are beginning to erode this meritocracy that we have had for 200, and, well, actually for 400 years. Um, uh, we, we don't keep track of, you know, you know little kids' scores anymore. It's like, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. So what, what message does that send those kids? Uh, some people would say, in fact, I just heard this morning on, on, on um, a business business news, they were they were talking about today's report on um, uh, employment, and it was generally a, a good report. But the, the problem is we don't have enough people working. So um, you know, and, and this particular gentleman who's an economist said, you know, I can't I can't get a plumber to come to my house. And why is this happening? And his his comment was, it's happening because they're they're not incentive for some reason to to work. Number one and number two, the public assistance has gotten so high that sometimes they they can make more money than they would by working. And so, what's the incentive to work at all? So, where does with this start? How do we teach these kids uh, not to be incented to do things? Um, college admissions are, are I mean, they, they, he had a whole chapter on this and it's really astounding. Uh, SATs are being dropped at a huge rate. And the reason of course is that is because they have to, been trying to balance uh, as would be desirable to balance the student body so that you so that you went, went across culture and race and uh, had a had a good mix of people, and made sure that those who were in the lower classes that were smart enough were would be able to move up. But they're taking the smart component out of that. Um, there, and they talk quite a lot about how Harvard has tried to um, correct this over time 
but in fact they're now doing reverse discrimination by keeping too many uh, Asians out. And the reason, and of course, they're the ones who've scored traditionally very highly on SATs. Now, SATs, Jordan Peterson says SATs and IQ tests are the single most uh, measurable and accurate way of determining success at the college level. Yet, colleges all over the, the country are saying, no, we don't want to have a yardstick to measure our, our kids on. Now, you could argue, um, and as I have, I, I, I didn't do all that well on the SATs myself, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I got in and I got out of college. So, you know, that was, apparently they it measured okay. They said, you are college material, barely, buddy. <laughs> you know, and I can um, relate, Ron. <laughs> yeah, so so it's like, okay, I knew ahead of time, I was gonna have to work really, really hard in order to compete. And I found that to be the, the case. I did have to work very, very hard in order to compete at that particular school. But nowadays, you just can't get in at all. See, it's like, sorry, it, it's not whether you can get through, it's just you have to fit a certain category. Uh, white males are not not at the top as we know and so you have to have either higher sats or you have to have a whole bunch of extracurricular activities or a lot of special letters or we're turn it's turning into nepotism you see and so we have we and, and all these examples given in the book i mean he's ruthless about about the uh, the, the top colleges <coughs> the top universities and how they have really let this go uh, and are fighting, actually fighting, having any real yardstick to measure. So you can always debate the yardstick, but you can't get rid of a yardstick because you can't measure anything anymore. No, that's a good point. And and in the in light of the conversation about families, I thought I'd try to find out what's the uh, what what's the likelihood of of a family-owned business moving to the next generation. Here's some interesting statistics. Only 30% of family businesses make it to the second generation. When you get to the third generation, it's only 12%. And only 13% of family businesses remain in business after 60 years. So it's um, so the, the point is, I would it would be interesting to know, based on what you're saying, Ron, um, were these companies that survived, were they better at being able to select talent or did their children just have more skill sets or were able, as we've said, been able to put something around them to make sure that their weaknesses were compensated for yeah. by a group of either outsiders or insiders. Yeah, that that would be very interesting to to really know more about that. I, you know, that that could say a couple things. It might say um, they can't stay in business because their their families are um, incompetent. Might say that. Mm -hmm. um, and then then the other the old axiom that I think is mostly truth. And that is that the second generation remembers how hard it was for the first generation to build their business. And right. so they tend to duplicate that, but the third generation has lost touch and they just assume it <clears throat> to be theirs, assume it to, to be there forever. <clears throat> and they're the ones who, who destroy the business, the third generation. Right. There's, you know, they're, <clears throat> that's, that's, that's filled with all kinds of, um, you know, inequities and wife's tales and so forth, probably. Um, but, but yeah, they do go broke. And so you have to kind of wonder, well, well, is it because they missed the market because they didn't make the changes or was it just incompetence? And I think, so, yeah, certainly of it, some of it is. The other big movement that is a real problem are unions. Now, Ray, you're not going to really like this, but uh, unions have a tendency to, to disincentivize individual workers. So what happens there is that, that um, they, they, they build the work rules in order to kind of be fair, right? But at the same time, um, the fairness puts people in a cubicle, not literally a cubicle, but it puts them in a work rule thing. Um, I've told you guys the story, and I, I won't belabor it very long, but the, the story about how I was a young guy was was working really hard in order to move these giant heavy baskets on an over overhead trolley um, and ultimately make the work a lot easier so that it would take one instead of two people. Well, the two guys 
that had been there day after day after day for years <clears throat> came back and they got me they got me replaced literally that afternoon <laughs> so um having somebody come in and working hard <clears throat> and especially with the union behind you disincentivizes the young buck you know to get out there and, and get the job done uh the <clears throat> the um you know young aggressive woman to to you know maybe act a little bit more aggressive because you know that's not feminine enough or you know i mean that's kind of what when you put these stereotypes there are already plenty of them but right. when, when when you take these these rules and, and you um concretize them now nobody ever breaks the rule and nobody ever stays one minute late and nobody ever works a little bit extra hard because you'll have other people criticize you for you know not gee you didn't take a break are you what are you doing you know that kind of stuff um but and, and of course it's actually worse than that <clears throat> apparently today i just heard this the new union settlement uh for railroads if we get it uh something as historic has happened and that is that the, all the unions have worked together in this particular case. It used to be, I think we had something 14 different unions for railroads, but they worked together. And so now they all work on the same set of regulations. And, you know, the first blush, you might say, well, gee, that's that's nice because, you know, you're not going to have really a, a problem between, you know, work rules that are not fair or that kind of thing. But what it also does is it creates a monopoly on our most important transportation network. No, there's some truth to that. I was going to share a story from a personal example. I was a member of the Laborers Union, having been in Alaska, you know, and I found that um, I was working for Bechtel Corporation in a management position, and my ex-wife was a laborer, and she was making twice as much as I was. And I finally said, well, this is silly. And I joined the Laborers Union. And I think it was really helpful for me to understand, you know, a little bit more about the inside workings of the labor union. Uh, when I got to Milwaukee, I stayed with the union because I was the one getting my master's degree and, and it provided me an excellent income, you know, so I was able to cover expenses and stuff. And I remember one particular day we were building a Kentucky Fried Chicken, the, the union, the union facility. And there was a large piece of concrete that was that needed to be picked up and put in, you know, um, one of the containers there, you know, and so I asked the two union guys to help me and they said, well, no, I'm not going to help you. That's that's uh, that weighs more than what we're supposed to carry. And two black guys came out of the restaurant, saw me uh, manhandling this thing and came over and helped me put it in and they weren't getting paid anything. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it's kind of an example of how, yeah. you know, these things can kind of get out of hand. Yeah, I have uh, I have a new a new oven coming and and the old one's going to be removed. And my wife was told, no, they they uh, they won't be able to take that out um, because these guys are movers. They're not electricians. She said, well, it's just a matter of unplugging it, isn't it? They said, I'm sorry, we, we can't do that. They, they won't do that. They won't unplug. They won't unplug it. So it's so like she unplugged it. Excuse me. Can't your wife unplug it or you? Yeah, of course, it? of course. Yeah. It's sort of like, okay, uh, can one of us unplug it? And they go, well, yeah, that'll be okay. But you see, you get you get to this point of absurdity. Right. Where it's right. like, well, these, these, these work rules. Right. And what happens? Well, you, you've now got a good company that uh, we've dealt with in the past, does appliances and kitchen repair and remodel, et cetera. And they hire a third party shipping company because they have their own issues, I guess, with delivery, et cetera. Uh, and while, while they seem to be just fine at doing their job, um, because of the work rules, they now are not satisfying the customer because of this absurdity. And yeah. so you, get, you get into these areas and the one thing that that you know we'll finish up with but i'll just mention because it's pertinent the one thing that has not changed is customers are still making decisions based on meritocracy so the unions are killing the customer relationships in this case well and i think if i can if i can piggyback on that a little bit i mean the reason that most family businesses 
do not make it to the next generation just for the very reason you're saying you know it's not based on merit but it's based on on um, genetics and as a consequence there is no correlation between the son and the parents and as a consequence you know that's why as you stated here the uh, that family businesses do so much more poorly than corporate uh, entities because the corporate entity can be, can hire on merit uh, well, but they, but they many times don't, but, you know, that, and I think well, they that, certainly do perform a lot better as, as your uh, evidence here shows. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they do. And, and I think for a variety of reasons too. So, and then another one, and then we'll kind of open this up um, <clears throat> a couple more government hires um, really for, for our supposed um, service, you know, who are supposed to be community service type people they're really not based on much of anything anymore. Now they have all these levels, which are, you know, I mean, there's so many unions, the, what is it, S-D-I-E or S-I-E-D, those unions are now really, you know, having way too much influence on government. And as a result, the government is now suffering from um, uh, really these work rules that are, that are developed under the guise of being fair. Uh, to to the employee, but on the other hand, the rest of us are kind of losing. And Ed Ed just was talking about the problems he had with uh, a government agency before we we went on. And and uh, uh, we may yeah Ed, why don't you just throw that out? That's an interesting story. Yeah, you mean with the IRS? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I got a a love note from the IRS on I think it was Wednesday, and said I owe significant amount of money because I filled out a form incorrectly, which was my fault, but easily collect, uh, corrected. I could correct it. But the bottom line was I got on the phone to try to talk to somebody and I was on the phone for two hours, you know, and they keep telling me you're next in line, you're next in line. And then when it came to five o'clock Eastern time, they, they disconnected my call. <laughs> yeah. So I got a call. I would have to call back in again without saying the same process or putting you in line or anything it's just yeah there's no callbacks or anything like that it's just uh and there's no warning that this was going to happen so yeah if you don't know what you're doing if you're not a professional how many people are going to get intimidated by that they get this this note they owe so much money how many are just going to say i don't know what to do i'm just going to pay it yeah yeah. And that's really a disservice to the general public, in my opinion. Right. And, and uh, you, you know, I might be going out on a limb here a little bit, but you can you can kind of bet that the that the uh, government unions are saying, hey, look, you you can't keep people online just because there are a bunch of people uh, that we couldn't get to, you, you, you know, at five o'clock, it's over. It shuts down and these people are standing up. And they are turning their machine off at one minute to five, and they are gone. And that's a mentality that's created yeah. by by the rule based, union based, government based um, attitudes by people who really would would rather be mediocre and not meritocratic. Well, I'm just going to switch it a little bit differently because I agree with everything you said about the unions, but I, I can see management doing the same thing. Oh, yeah. Management yeah. is under the um, the uh, statement that they have to keep over. They have to reduce overtime or eliminate overtime. So they'll just tell their people that when it comes five o'clock, we just we shut down. Well, yeah. well, you're right. And of course, that's a that's a different one, which I didn't list. And maybe it's part of it here. But <clears throat> The rules, especially in California, the rules about employment behavior are so strict <laughs> that 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 the people have to check out, as we as we know, based on client experience, they have to check out on the button, you know, right at four o'clock or whatever the time is, um, or yeah. the the fines are insane. However, and, if you're a union, you don't have to abide by these rules. You have your own union contract that you adhere to. Does that override the, the... Yes, it overrides everything. So all those laws are pretty much for non-union companies. Okay, interesting. Because, the I mean, the unions have their own way of dealing with those types of things. Right. 
And um, it's a real disservice because, I mean, you need to have uh, 10 minute breaks in the morning and the, in the afternoon. If you missed your lunch hour for whatever reason, most people wanted to, sometimes people like to skip their lunch and go home early. They don't have that option anymore. No, right. Yeah, that's right. And, it used and then to they get the uh, the trial attorneys involved, and then all these these uh, companies get lawsuits. Right. 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 They do. The know, and that brings up a point. A lot of this could be resolved with tort reform. <laughs> yes. Well, but the but where the the rules come come from from the state lawmakers. Yeah, yeah they do. Uh, and and they have agendas, and their agenda is like the gig law. Their agenda was because they're beholden to a particular union yeah. that felt as though independent people were cutting the weight, the, the prices of, say, cleaning ladies or um, uh, child care or even people who run their, their own beauty parlors. <clears throat> and therefore, they want to force them into a set of rules, which is similar to whatever the union rules are. Um, and of course, they do it on saying that, well, we're balancing the competition, but really what they're doing is they're standardizing performance at a level which is uh, makes it very difficult to compete any better than anybody else. So they're hurting small business in every single case. And then the last one is that uh, corporations, um, while they tend to be more meritocratic, merit, meritoc merit based, <laughs> um, now we have all of these new hiring initiatives that are going beyond, you know, they want to balance uh, across race and ethnicity and culture, et cetera. Um, and, and while that's not a bad goal, we're not, we have gotten to the point where it's uh, perhaps getting, getting out of hand and a little bit to the level of absurdity in a way. Um, so, you know, as, as a result, people good people are not being hired in order to hire another person who may not have the same qualifications but they fit a category and that is beginning to um, er erode even corporate meritocracy um, and he goes into great length on that too and I think we all kind of know and understand what's kind of going on with that but so there are other things too that I may have missed here that are that are sort of um, indicating indicating the the loss of meritocracy and and i think I, i'm kind of convinced that if we lose that then there's really no place for us to go except to compete with uh, and here's the irony who's where's one of the biggest meritocracy uh countries in the world china yeah yeah so these people are working hard they don't have these union rules they have one union that's that's the communist party mm -hmm. and um so they all abide by whatever that is and at this point in time uh there, there aren't there's nothing to keep those people from holding two jobs and working hard and doing whatever it takes to survive and to thrive and that's why they have turned their country around is because they have been a meritocratic they've been merit-based uh, in most cases, now the government does interfere a whole lot. We know that, and and the government is not fair to be. I'm, this is not a pro communist employee <laughs> in any way. What they've done is they've using used a Western concept to compete with us. Yes. And we, yeah. on the other hand, are moving towards um, the old anti nepotism of our forefathers in in Europe. They got rid of it. They're bringing it back through social programs, and we're moving that direction now. Um, don't know how much longer we'll be able to do what we're doing and still be competitive worldwide. So, what are some of the other things that are in the way? I, th I think that's a real good point, and I, I I think one of the most stunning things for me when I went back to Vietnam after 50 years um, was to see how. You know, all of our fears about it becoming a communist country and therefore, you know, going into falling into nothingness, etc. When I left Vietnam, there wasn't a building in Saigon that was over 10 stories. You know, it was it was a kind of a it was a, a large community, but by any standards we have in the United States, it was a backwater, right? Yeah. I mean, when I was there in 2019, there were literally 
hundred story buildings. I mean, it was absolutely astounding to see, as you pointed out, Ron, you know, how they had adapted the communist form of government and married it with capitalism and have just gone absolutely bonkers. And to your point, they're kicking our butt. Yeah. Whether it's in China or it's in Vietnam or wherever, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they're taking our model and, and they're bouncing it off against our softness. You know, our, well, I don't know if I want to work that hard. I'm not sure that that's a good thing for me right now, et cetera. Um, but sadly, uh, it seems to be the case today that, you know, as you pointed out, people are not as interested in working hard <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the price for that. that's right. And, uh, and, and I think you were right. I mean, when you came back from that trip to Vietnam and uh, had so much to say, you know, about how they had, had advanced, I mean, it, it really kind of blew my mind. I mean, I knew that they were doing well, but um, your description of it was like way beyond belief, really. And and there are other countries that have done the same thing. I mean, Singapore is in the same situation, and uh, and and many many other uh, countries are kind of moving that way. Um, there are people who want to work because they want to better their situation. Right. Right. And and here we we end up looking more like uh, third century Rome. You yeah. know where where we've got the uh, Colosseum full of uh, um, you know fighting and gladiators and everybody got a loaf of bread every day for free. Right. And the people were just fat, dumb, and happy. Um, that that begins to feel a whole lot about what's going on in this country, and the the meritocracy is the thing that is both the carrot and the stick. And if you take one of, or the other or both of them away, then you just fall into what is easy and lazy. And of course, that's a word that is not even used in our culture anymore. Nobody talks yeah. about the word lazy because that makes it seem as though you're dissing them or, you know, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that there are people who don't want to work. And we certainly know that in our economy today. No, there that's true. Are millions and millions of people who do not want to work. That's why we can't get a plumber to come to our house. That's probably true. I think one of the things that I shared with you guys earlier today, I sent the article about a, a manufacturing company that's actually being run by high schoolers, you know, which is uh, so, yeah. you know, there are some points of bleakness, but there are also areas, you know, and I've felt this for many years, you know, it's amazing how, how quickly we, we point fingers at the younger generation, you know, about how they don't want to work hard and stuff. And I remember saying to somebody one time, well, well, who raised these kids? <laughs> well, that's right. That, that's... You know, I mean, they're that way for a reason. And, yeah, sure. and maybe that's an exaggeration because there are these pockets of, of kids and people who really are still interested in meritocracy, do want to make a difference. Right. And with these kids that are going to run this manufacturing business, it's just astounding, you know. Yeah. And and they are bright and they're talented. And and how do we how do we I think to your point, Ron, you know, how do we help them really move forward with this uh, merit based system that you keep talking about? Because basically that's our salvation. Well, I, I, I want to I want to make one point. I don't know. Did the author have any comments about age? Um, not really, not, not really in, in, in terms of the younger generation, not really wanting to work, et cetera. No, I'm, I'm thinking more in line with the uh, older people being discriminated from opportunities. Oh yeah. No, because he, of he didn't. the age that they have, not yeah. what they bring to the party. Right. Which means that you would rather hire a, a, a brand new person um, to do a job that has no knowledge, no expertise, rather than bringing in someone who can hit the ground running and make a significant contribution to your company. Yeah, he, he didn't bring that, but I'm, I'm sure he would agree with that. Yeah, yeah and I think, I think that, that speaks uh, volumes about our efforts to say, look, you don't have to hire us on a full-time basis. But the fact is when you get uh, somebody you know, with our level of experience, they can accomplish more in a small amount of time than an inexperienced person can do full time. Right. So, exactly. I mean, it becomes, again, an opportunity, I think, for all of us to really move things forward in a meaningful way. Yeah. So think of all the biases that are in every HR department, every company, every company in this country. 
that they will not bend the rules and look at what qualifications someone's bringing to the to the job. They're yeah, making that's really it simple. true. Or make it very simple. You got this, this, and this, and you have to be this age. Yeah. And that brings up a whole nother area. And we've talked about it uh, kind of on the sides. And that is how do you go about the hiring process? Right. And so, you know, what's fair? I mean, I, th I think everybody wants fairness as, uh, as well as if you are fairly, say, hired and evaluated then there's a carrot out here that's going to help you progress. You're going to get additional training, additional money, bonuses. You know, there's a reason for you to work hard. Now, of course, the overarching reason is productivity is the only place where races come from. You see, nobody, nobody really talks about this. Yeah. Races don't come from thin air. They come from, from being able to stretch the margin a little bit. And you can stretch the margin by having productive people. How, whether they work a little harder, uh, sweat a little harder, or you have work automation, smarter. work smarter. Exp right. Yeah. If you, you know, and I think I think one of the things I've always uh, appreciated about Ed is that you know what kind of what kind of systems in place do you have for continuous improvement. You know, yeah. how do you continue to ask your people at all levels what would you do to make your job easier and to make us more productive? Because we'll turn it back to you in some meaningful way. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, the, the company needs to be trusted it, that yeah. that's going to happen. It's like you go out and you do it and you right. treat it hard and you, you, you in good faith, you're working hard for the company. You, you have to have some, some track record that, yeah, so-and-so is going to be rewarded. Right. Yeah. But can you, and then, and then you go, yeah, that's what we want to do. And then you find out, oh, wait a minute, we've got a couple of unions we have to deal with. Yeah, I think in any- no, You can't do that anymore, you see. Well, no, I, I would agree, but, uh, you know, to, as a counterpoint to what you're saying, Ron, you know, we are at the lowest level of unions in the last 60 years, you know, so unions are not really as much a, an important part of our business community as they were, let's say, 30 and 40 years ago. Um, I mean, they've lost favor. Now they're starting to come back a little bit, but yeah. they're not as much a, I think a lot of what we talk about is as much a consequence of poor management as it is unions today uh, well you're, yeah you're you're right about that and and i you're i agree unions don't have the impact the direct impact that they had years ago mm -hmm. um uh however the consolidation of an industry into a single union uh a really bad sign and in addition to that that was point pointed out recently is that <clears throat> In fact, it was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. California is now acting like a union. This new commission on um, restaurant wages literally is, has unionized the entire state for restaurant workers. They're going to set minimum wage. They're going to decide how that's going to work in what city, how they're going to allocate based on uh, cost of living and a variety of things. So now we have a group of, you know, who knows how many, a group of czars who are magically having had no business experience ever, magically going to come up with the right way to do this. And I think we all understand that that won't work. Well, that's a union. So the in, in Sacramento and many other states act like unions only they call themselves legislatures. Yeah, and what no, they I, do I, I, is they're creating work rules that make it very difficult um, for all but the big guys who have tons of people to manage this, make it difficult to stay in business. We've talked about this before. So right. while I, I, I know you're right in terms of the actual number of unions, I think our society and, and our laws are so much more, say, union leaning or work, Maybe worker employee leaning. Friendly, employee friendly, is that what you're saying? Well, uh, I think. Than employer? Well, I, th I, th I think, uh, I think when, when you have a bureaucracy, the natural tendency is we want to get bigger, we want to make more rules, we want to preserve our power. And so you have a lot of, of, of these machines that are involved in labor. Hmm. And we have lots of those people doing that. The AQMD is, you know, on environmental issues does it. And not everything they do is a scientific fact. Right, right. Uh, 
We have the same thing for work safety. Not everything they do is a scientific fact, yet they have the ability to impose these things. And once they're imposed, they're nearly impossible to get rid of. Yeah. This is what small businesses are dealing with today. So on one hand, we've got the small business who are the only ones left that can be truly independent and make their own decisions. But they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of everybody else who's kind of gotten on the, we've got to have a lot more rules. And um, we're not all that concerned about, quote, productivity. You should just be able to figure it out and, and give the raises as we decide to give them. Yeah, no, I think there's a, there's certainly an unfairness in that. And, you know, as we've, we've talked over and over again, you know, there, there is little, there's very little support for small businesses per se. You know, I mean, you, you, I, you know, when you, when you go out there, you're, 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 you're on your own. Serengeti and the lions are out to get you. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And 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 the the more this small business people know and understand that, the the better protected they are to to be able to kind of deal with it. Um, but boy, it's awfully difficult. You have, I mean, this this new rule of having more than five employees, and now you have to have a have a um, defined benefit program, just like a big giant company does. Well, wow, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like, well, how are you going to do that? Well, now you've got to go hire somebody to manage that because you have no idea how to take care of that. And of course, the the rules are books full of forms that have to be sent out. So you are right. <clears throat> there are no friendly people in Sacramento or many other capital cities uh, to small business. They they just assume everybody can deal with every rule that they come up with. And they're they're shaping society as a result. They're they're not making rules that are safety they're, oriented. They're just they're also them. they're also putting companies out of business. Oh, it happens every day. Because all of a sudden they get they get a lawsuit against them for not complying with some ridiculous rule yeah. that happened ten years ago with two or three employees, and then they can bring the company down with that's right end of dollars in settlement fees right and they're, in, they're, they're they're so inconsistent uh in in their rulings um our uh, our buddy ray um, marjorie uh, i won't mention the name of the company uh said to you and and i i think maybe on separate occasions every time somebody from the government steps in the front door it costs me ten thousand dollars <laughs> And one time it's someone from the county who says that she's getting too, putting too much dirt on the road from her parking lot. They've been there for 35 years. Mm -hmm. Another time it's somebody from another agency, another one from another agency. And not only are the, do they all have different rules, but the same person will come back and enforce one rule one time and a different rule the next time. Yeah. So there's this level of inconsistency which comes from this level of power that has been legislated away by by our, our lawmakers and the bureaucracy can't help itself it's just human nature when you allow a big bureaucracy to happen you you begin to erode uh the principles of meritocracy so it's a it's a real um it's a tough situation yeah now let me just throw out another kind of another twist to our conversation as i mentioned very briefly but there's only one thing that will help fix this. And that is that the consumer will continue to be able to make decisions based on the perceived value they have of the company and the product. In other words, they will make their decisions based on merit to right, them. Right, right. And so uh, the, the restaurant workers who think they're going to get a wage for a few years of a couple bucks more um, are going to find that they're they're not going to be as competitive as somebody who's automated more or comes up with a new idea, and as a result, they're not going to have any job right. because that restaurant will go out of uh, business. Because you and point. you and I will decide that if you're going to pay twelve or fifteen dollars for a hamburger, that you may as well go to a nice restaurant, not McDonald's. So, you know, we'll make our own decisions and then we'll have a whole bunch of losers who will also lose their employees and those employees will now be on public benefit. Well, they'll lose the business, you know, so that's, yeah. that's the hard part. Yeah, so that, that's kind of where that goes. And that's because uh, you can't really 
run the economy, the, the economy actually is a natural, this is my opinion, the, the economy is actually like nature. If you abuse nature, eventually something happens. If you abuse the economy, something happens. Right. Uh, we're, we're, we're going through that right now. Our leaders in Washington have abused the financial tools that has been given. And, and we're, we're having tough times now. And it's going to get potentially a lot tougher, you know. Yeah. So do we want to wrap this up for today, guys? Yeah, I think, I think so. so. Yeah. Just wanted to get that thing in that the customer is always the is right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that's the whole point is that the customer is always right because if he doesn't want to buy, he has a choice. That's in right. Fact, if we could do this over again, we should start with that statement. <laughs> well, yeah. And so, so uh, you know, the, and, the, and the amazing thing, just to kind of wrap it up, is that it's meritocracy that provides the incentive for all the people in a company to do a great job for the customer right. without that you you end up with the russian economy where as ronald reagan said one time uh I, the guy went in to buy a car and he had to pay for it and and he, he put the cash down and he said come back in 10 years and we'll give you the car <laughs> which has been the 80s yeah and so of course it's a joke and, yeah. and of course the, and then the guy says oh well will that be in the morning or afternoon <laughs> and he said well what difference does it make if it's in the morning or afternoon 10 years from now yeah that's right that's funny and he said because i've got to make an appointment for my plumber yeah. <laughs> uh. and so it's like there's russia um <clears throat> they haven't managed to improve very much since uh since the wall fell and, and they certainly have been proving that in uh in yeah <laughs> yeah so we can we can see what that kind of government leads to uh and uh let's let's just uh let's just all hope that uh people will listen to this message and realize meritocracy has to be preserved yeah well thank you ron <laughs> Good job. um and um do uh, are you are we done i think are, we're done are, are you recording it or not um, I, yes, I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs>